Hi, I'm Ali Patterson. On this episode, we're going to look at how we can use data to improve the customer experience. For this, we speak with Jonathan Wax from Nexedia about what they're doing with data. We also speak with Chris Popple again from RBS about using information to deliver a better, more secure experience. But first, we head over to RSA to speak with Jonathan Elliott about their approach to the digital customer. Obviously, we live in quite a, a digital age now. So how would you go about capturing and engaging customers during the, their first digital mile? I, I'm less, I lose less sleep over the way things are developing in the digital and social media world. The thing that um, keeps me awake at night more is how we leverage data in a way which protects the customer and is good for the customer. When you know, the exponential increase in the sort of data that's available, um, it's really, really hard to get to really valuable insights that you can use in your business. So you know, I, th I think of the example of telematics, but we equally have the prospect of being able to get technology in the home which creates all sorts of information about a customer, which is actually, um, you could argue, is quite important to protect that for the customer, but equally you could offer great services and value to a customer. How's that all going to happen and change? Insurance, financial services are then starting to move into an environment where they compete with the likes of Microsoft and Google and Amazon. And, you know, those companies have huge innovation pedigree, um, which is less the case in financial services. So our challenge has got to be to adapt, to be able to innovate, to be able to use data in a way that's good for the customer and good for business and embrace all of those different channels and there'll be more in a year's time. Um, so that, that's the challenge for us, innovation, leveraging data um, and making it of value to a customer. So, so data is used in many different ways in, in the insurance industry. One of them obviously is around making sure you give the best price to a customer for the risk that they yeah. present. As I said earlier, I think the, the sources of data are exploding. Um, and with all that data comes the opportunity to actually provide a lot more of a well-priced solution for a customer. So it is really important to access that. It is a challenge. Um, and one of the things that we've done within RSA is to build an environment which can consolidate vast sources of information so that you can do all the read across is to, to work out what's best for a customer. Whereas many, many businesses have to deal with that very challenging situation where there's pockets of data in several places. And you know, at a simple level, you may have addresses for customers in three or four different environments and systems. And they may, some of them may be different. <laughs> so you get all sorts of data contention issues that you have to deal with. But bringing it all together into a single environment is really important. And then you can start looking at um, how the different bits of the data can then be used to offer value to a customer. One of the most exciting sources of data and data application is speech analytics. I went to speak with Jonathan Wax from Nexedia to hear what they're doing in that field. The core of what we've done is speech analytics. You know, we, we were founded on, on uh, to commercialise some speech technology 15, 16 years ago. And I think what we've seen over the last two or three years is speech analytics becoming more mainstream in terms of people's understanding of it. Um, I still think the, the number of deployments is less than some people think. And, and again, um, people are then saying, right, I understand what it can do. They're becoming, sort of, I suppose, quite discerning about what they can use it for. You know, so from our point of view, we're turning around and saying, we like to address the market in probably five areas. So it's sales effectiveness, it's cost optimization, it's customer experience, it's, um, it's com you know, compliance, and, so, you know, and that's the type of areas we work on. Uh, the interesting thing is once all the data's in there, you know, let's say my interest is compliance. You know, that's what's driving me. I'm an investment bank. Yeah. No, let's take a go, let's go to retail bank. I'm a retail yeah. bank. And I'm, I'm interested in making sure I'm compliant. And then suddenly, you know, someone says, oh, well, you know the FCA's paper on vulnerable customers. How, yeah, what are we doing on vulnerability? And you're going, oh, um, well, we have a policy. You know, and he goes, right, I've got a policy. And what's the policy say? And then you can turn around and go, right, how often is this happening across my calls? You know, and it could be if someone mentions, I don't know, bereavement or mental illness or whatever, you can go into the calls and say, do you realise this is happening in 12%, 2%, whatever the numbers are. But I think the, the key thing about it is most people are starting to use it for a, a quite focused business area. Yeah. But then the fact is they've then got all their interactions structured. And, and it's this idea that actually, I'm not saying, you know, you can also, if someone just you know, impromptu comes along and says, 
has anyone talked to us about whether we've had a, cyber, a data breach? Uh, you know, and you may not have had one, but you know, people are saying, is it being mentioned? And the fact you can then delve in and very quickly come back and go, you know, we've had 27 inquiries or 5,000 inquiries. So I think you know, the way people are using, the starting to use speech analytics now is, is some of it is ongoing business support. Uh, some of it is probably more akin to reporting. It's a, it's a, a real-time type report. You know, it's, it's day in, day out, intraday reporting. People are using it definitely from a coaching perspective, changing the way their agents are deal stuff. And then it's that ability to do ad hoc stuff. So it could be, you know, it could that's where something like on a security breach or a security question, or how often are people talking about the portable app or the, you know, whatever it may be. So I think people are using it, as I say, starting in one area, and then as as it becomes deployed and people see what's happening, they go, oh, could we use it for that? Cool, could we use it for that? And, and I think that's how it's it's deploying out. I would say. Not many people would buy it just for churn, even though there's probably a big case for it, but most of them have started from within the contact centre, and then it's actually, as you think about how you deal with customers, it's growing out that way. And that's really, I think, how we see most of our analytic deployments happening. Of course, having the data and the information is only half the journey. What is done with it is key. How to use that information for the benefit of you and the customer. So I've come to speak with Chris Popple from RBS about the customer experience. How do you analyse data and, and when you do, what information have you found particularly useful, such as yeah. geolocation? I think, um, uh, so there's, there's kind of, I think of data in two different ways. Um, uh, so there's raw numbers data, so um, we have a team that's sat right over there actually, who spend a lot of time in um, uh, basically accounting events, so how many phone calls, you know, how many, which, which pages were hit on the website, what functions were used in the, um, in the mobile banking app, and and we lay those out and look for patterns. You know where are there are anomalies, where where again the, the time difference between calling and making a payment, for instance. Um, and then there is um, uh, subjective data, which is m more kind of building the story that goes around the events. So that what that means is, so for instance, in call centers now we do two things: we measure, yeah. compare it to other the other events in other channels, and we ask our agents. Um, essentially a, a subset of them every week to record the context around the call. So we can sort of marry up what's the story behind yeah. the actual events. And those two things together allow us to say, well, actually, that makes it actionable so we can do something about it, right? So with the story we were talking about before about uh, a customer who has been in online banking and then calling up and making a payment, what I had in mind is actually a story around international payments. International payments are notoriously difficult because you've got to enter in quite a lot of different information. Um, and what our, we did was we measured the events um, and then layered the stories who tagged the calls you know, with, with real stories. We learned that actually it's more about international payments and the, and the real pain point is make it more clear about what customer and information customers need to have in order to make the payment when they get into online banking. So we made some changes actually in the online banking and the website to be much more clear about the things you need to have ready before you actually make the payment. So I think it's a mixture of the counting things and then being able to wrap the story around it that gives us the insight. One of the front lines for customer experience is the contact center. I asked, what was the core to running a cost-effective contact center? I mean, I've spent most of my, year, my, my career in the call center industry and um, in, in a number of different sort of verticals and different businesses. And I think um, I see it really as simply as there's two things you need to get right. Um, there is getting the task right, the transaction, the reason a customer chooses to contact you via email or, or calls. And then there's importantly the spirit in which you do that task. So if you can get the blend of those two right, then great service does cost less. You know, customers don't have the need to contact you so much, they can find the information they need, things are explained simply and easily, so again, no need for, the, for putting the customer through effort, and effort costs the customer time and it costs the company money. So they do all converge into the same place. Where I see uh, companies who perhaps don't do so well in this space is where they focus very relentlessly on the task, and they try and reduce the number of transactions, and they try and um, put everything online. And at the end of the day, um, the spirit in which you do something is three times more important than the, the task itself, in terms of a customer's perception about how they feel about a business. And we know that's really important in terms of retention, um, and growing your business. So we've invested very heavily in the spirit in, where, in the way we do things. How would, you, how would you describe that spirit? So one, one example would be, um, there used to be this sort of model 
of um, you deliver the sort of service that you would expect to receive as a customer. Yeah. But what you want from your service provider and what I want from my service provider may well be different. So we've adopted a different approach, which is to look at categories of customer. And by listening to a call, you can tune into what sort of customer you're, you're dealing with. So you have the time poor customer who just needs to get to an answer really quickly. And you have other customers who, who need a little bit of empathy, particularly when claiming. They need to know that you're going to be there for them, that you show some um, passion in what you're doing and some feeling for the situation they find themselves in. If you tune into the wrong customer and you, and you have the wrong person at the end of the phone, you can create quite a lot of conflict. Yeah. So we've really sort of helped people with skills to identify what does the customer really need from that conversation and really try and match their need as well as do the job that they want you to do. One of the reasons for categorizing and understanding your customer is to help reduce customer churn. I discussed this further with Nexedia. How big an issue is customer churn for banks? Are some of the new disrupted in the digital banks like Atom and Iwaka, are they increasing this level of customer churn? It's an area people talk about. We've seen less evidence, of it, certainly from the engagements we have with the customers. I think people are aware of it, you know, and, and I suppose, again, you can um, segment, segment it down to the customer set. So you've got a retail area where people have to change accounts. You've then got so sort of the SMB area where banks have, have uh, you know, been lending less historically, especially after the, the, the downturn in the last few years. And then you've got mainstream corporate banking. So I think we see some areas of those changing. But um, from, from the projects we've got going, people are aware of it, but it's not as compelling an issue. You know, if we, for example, if we go to communications, People are really aware that people, you know, their churn rates, people's defection rates, people moving, um, even in you know insurance as well. You know, general insurance, motor insurance, home insurance, it's there. It it doesn't quite, doesn't seem to have quite impacted across the board in banking yet. But I think it's one of those ones. It's a question. It's only a question of time as new entrants come in, as the technology enables some of these new entrants. Um, you know, people who traditionally said, "Well, I'm going to open a bank," and in, you know, like going around the corner into high street. You know, I think that's going to start to change. I suppose the other issue is if you move accounts, a lot of people don't shut accounts, so there's not necessarily closure, but then you do transfer direct, you know, it's like you have a lot of ongoing transactions, direct debits or possibly standing orders, and those, when it's, I think it's those that are being transferred. And, and again, if you don't do all them in one go, if you just every so often just set new ones up, then I think it's, 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 it's probably like the, um, you know, the, the frog boiling analogy. You know, it is, it's just slowly happening and, and you're slowly losing customers over a period of time, and I think that, that could be part of it. So what can a bank do with its data to reduce churn? Right, there is more data now than ever before. How do you use the information that you have on your customers, both from a security and a customer experience perspective? Um, we have more data points. It allows us to protect customers better. So, you know, definitely, you know, having, you know, using our relationships with Vodafone and O2 and whatnot, having more information about um, the device and the type and what it gives us more 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 patterns that we can establish to make sure that it isn't you know, a fraudster trying to take you know take your money from you. That's definitely one. What we've started to do over the last year, particularly, is starting to use our own data about how customers use branches and te telephones and web chat and mobile and, and, and online t and marrying that stuff so we can establish patterns to figure out where we might be able to do things better. So a really interesting piece of, uh, of insight we've um, been working on lately is that actually when, when customers call us, um, at least half those customers have been using online banking within a couple hours prior, which kind of gives us some, so well, why do they do that? Um, and they're not calling us then, obviously, because they want to transaction, transact over the phone. They're calling us because they've seen something in online that they're confused by. And so rather than focusing necessarily on the phone call and making that better, which we are, but is go back to, well, what are we communicating to a customer in online? So for instance, is their balance clear? What comprises, do they understand um, where they've spent their money? And working on that so that customers then don't feel like they need to call up to answer a question that we probably could have answered better in another channel. So really using the data we have and usage across channels to figure out what we're not doing so well to, to do it better so that customers don't have to do more. What we're trying to be best in market, we're really trying to be best in customer experience, um, which means we're, we're probably more focused in where are the pain points, where are we confusing, uh, where can we be more simple, and, and therefore using the, the behavior or what customers do across channels really helps us in that. Um, within that, I think also, um, so if, you, if you're better at customer service, then you're going to reduce churn. 
Um, so, but looking for reasons why churn necessarily is, uh, that's kind of the, the end of the, the game, yeah. kind of the beginning of the game is, so what kind of pain in the service do we create and how can we fix it? But definitely by looking at data between channels as opposed to just singularly is a, is a key part of that. If you look at the efficiency base level, you know, I think most organizations have been trying to sit and go, um, one of my most expensive contact points actually is the contact center because I'm employing people to have conversations. If I could move to self-service, which I could be doing off a phone or a you know, smart device, it's a lot lower cost. So I think a number of them have, have invested heavily in some quite good technology. You know, you look at some of the mobile apps now, they're incredibly good. The challenge is when, you know, making it pervasive, make, getting people into the habit of using them rather than ringing up. And, and I think one of the ways we've been able to do it is, um, if, if certainly uh, from an analytical point of view, we look at the, the customer sentiments. And if you ever map out, if, we, if any organization gives us data, and we can, we can create a sentiment graph, and you do effectively get nearly always of something form of standard distribution graph. And the highest point, so it's the highest number of calls, typically has the lowest handle time, and it has zero sentiment. And that's sort of, to my mind, that's a definition of a transaction, isn't it? You know, yeah. It's very quick, one thing happens. And it's, and it's right, okay, so I can now bucket all those calls. If I go into all those calls and go, what are the common issues here? You can go, right, these are the top five things, top ten things that, that, that are my transactions or true transaction interactions. So then what I need to do is make sure that my alternative app supports all of those. They probably do. But then the second one is to then is to get the culture in the organization of promoting self-service, of people saying, you know, if you rang up for... I don't, it was changing a direct debit, you know, saying you do realise that you could do that on your phone, you know, because you can see, you'll see from the record that I've downloaded the app, that I'm running the app, um, and so, uh, so I think that's the other, the other part is reinforcing the message that you have there. So that's one element of it, um, and, and, and that, you know, the more you can do that channel shift, that you're right, that's where there's a, a, a cost saving, that's what's driving that. So in terms of efficiency, how important is it to bring all of your information together? So, so yeah, bringing all customer information together does ensure that you then have, you're only dealing with one environment, so you can uh, create much stronger privacy and data control um, orthodoxies, if I can use that word, so protecting the customer's data. There are also a lot of new innovations, which I think the most uh, Department of Work and Pensions have a, uh, a tool which allows customers to actually control the data that they give access to a company. And so they essentially have their own safe for their data. Okay. And the company takes a feed from that. So again, it puts a lot more control into a customer's hands. Now we're looking at that. I, th I think that's quite an exciting development because trend-wise, I think e even if you look at telematics as well, I talked to earlier about controlling your premium. It's all about how do you give more control to the customer over you know, access to the data, the price they pay for a service, and the choices they have to make. On the next episode of FinTech Finance, we look at some of the latest innovations, including a cashless cash machine. <laughs>